Hello, this is Dr. Joe Trout from the Physics Program at Stockton University. This lecture is on linear momentum and collisions. Momentum, or linear momentum, is defined as the product of the su system's mass multiplied by its velocity. We use a lowercase p, and it's a vector because velocity is a vector. So the momentum, p, equals the mass times the velocity. The units of p are kilogram meters per second. One physicist described it as momentum is a quality that describes an object's resistance to stopping, a kind of moving inertia. So if it has a lot of momentum, it's hard to stop. So you could either have a huge mass and, a s and moving slowly, it's hard to stop. Or you could have a small mass moving really fast, it's also hard to stop. If we look at S Newton's second law, it can be written in terms of momentum. So the net force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time. And the change of momentum will be the change in mass times velocity If the mass is constant, then it's equal to the mass times the change in velocity over the change in time. But the change in velocity over the change in time is just the acceleration. So if you remember a few chapters ago, we said the net force was equal to the mass times the acceleration if the mass is constant. Really, we should say the net force is equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. So each one of the rugby players has a great momentum will to affect the outcome of their collisions with each other and the ground. We also like to talk about impulse. An impulse is the force times time. So it's the force and times how long the force was in contact with the object. So for instance, here's a graph of force versus times along the x-axis. And what we see is at the beginning of the force is not, is not very large. And as time goes on, the force gets larger and larger and larger. And then it starts to decrease as time goes on. The impulse is equal to the area under this graph. Since that takes calculus, what we can do is define the effective or the, f or the average force by this dotted line. And now the area is really easy to do. It's just the height times the width or the force effective times the change in time. So what kind of problems can we do with momentum? So here we have a car of mass 1 moving with a velocity of v1 initial and it bumps into another car with a mass 2 and a velocity of v2. As a result, the first car slows down to a velocity of v1 final, and the second speeds up with a velocity of v2 final. And the momentum of each car is changed, but the total momentum of the two cars is the same. So initially we have the mass of this car times its velocity plus the mass of this car times its velocity. And the total momentum of the system, that will equal the total momentum of the system. After the collision, their velocities might change and their individual momentums might change, but the sum of the momentum or the total momentum is still equal to the initial momentum, or the momentum before the collision equals the momentum after the collision. So the net force is equal to the change in momentum. And if mass is a constant, it's equal to the mass times the change in velocity over the change in time, which is the mass times the acceleration.
if the net force is zero, that means that the change in momentum is zero and the momentum initial equals the momentum final, right? So sometimes we write the momentum before the collision is P and the momentum after the collision is P prime. So in this case, P is P initial and P prime is P final. Either way, you can, do, you can use either notation. So here's an example. Here's a skater uh, on a skateboard and they're standing on the skateboard and the person has a mass of 40 kilograms and the skateboard has a mass of 10 kilograms. And they jump off, the skater jumps off the skateboard. So the skater applies a force to the skateboard and the skateboard applies an equal and opposite force to the skater. And this is Newton's third law. So let's see what happens. The skater jumps off and the skateboard flies back in the opposite direction. So next time you're near a skateboard, give this a try, right? Stand on it and then jump off and the skateboard will go off in the other direction. So let's say we can measure the skateboard and it goes off at negative five meters per second. So it's moving in the negative X direction. What we can say is the momentum initial equals the momentum final. So the mass of the skateboard times the initial velocity of the skateboard plus the mass of the skater times the initial velocity of the skater equals the mass of the skateboard times the final velocity of the skateboard plus the mass of the skater times the final velocity of the skater. However, the initial velocity of both the skateboard and skater were zero because they were standing still. And now we know what the final velocity of the skateboard is. We can find the final velocity of the skater. So we'll move this mass of the skateboard times the final velocity of the skateboard over the other side, it becomes negative. Divide by the mass of the skater. So that will be minus 10 kilograms times negative five meters per second divided by 40 kilograms. We end up with 1.25 meters per second. And I apologize, this should be a plus sign right here, right? So this should be positive 1.25 meters per second. That was just a typo. So whenever we have momentum and we have a collision, we start with conservation of momentum. So here, the momentum of one plus the momentum of two before the collision equals the momentum of one plus the momentum of two after the collision. And this time, instead of using initial and final, we're going to use P and P prime. So we get the mass times the velocity of one plus the mass times the velocity of two equals the mass times the velocity of one prime plus the mass times the velocity of two prime. So here's an example. Here we have mass one. It's two kilograms, moving at three meters per second. Mass two, four kilograms, moving at one meter per second. And they collide into one another. And after the collision, we find out that mass two's velocity is moving faster. Okay? So first let's find the initial momentum. So we have the mass times the velocity, of the mass of one times the velocity of one initial, plus the mass of two times the velocity of two initial. That'll be two kilograms times three meters per second plus four kilograms times one meter per second. So that's six plus four is 10 kilogram meters per second. That's the initial momentum. But during the collision, the net force was zero. So momentum's conserved 
So it e also equals the final momentum. So the final momentum, which is the mass of one times the velocity of one final, plus the mass of two times the velocity of two final, also equals 10, meter, 10 kilogram meters per second. And now we can find the final velocity of what mass one. So we'll subtract the momentum of two, the final momentum of two, which is the mass of two, the velocity of two final, divided by the mass of one. So we get 10 kilogram meters per second minus four kilograms two meters per second. So that's 10 minus eight is two divided by two. We get one meter per second. So the final velocity of one is one meter per second. And we use the fact that the initial momentum before the collision equaled the final momentum after the collision. What about kinetic energy? Well, if we add up the initial kinetic energy, we get one half the mass of one, the velocity of one initial. So that'll be one half times two times three squared, so that's nine, plus one half times four is two times one, we get 11 joules. And if we look at the final kinetic energy, so for um, our final velocity of two, we had two meters per second. And we'll plug in for the final velocity of one. We end up with nine joules. So since the kinetic energy initial does not equal the kinetic energy final, we say that this is an inelastic collision. So some of the energy went into doing something during the collision. So if the initial kinetic energy does not equal the final kinetic energy, it's inelastic. Let's consider something that's totally inelastic. So for a totally inelastic collision, the objects stick together after the collision. So here we have M1, which is two kilograms, times three meters per second. And we have M2, which is four kilograms, and one meter per second. So we end up with 10 kilogram meters per second is our initial momentum, okay? In this case, our final momentum, since they're both stuck together, is equal to the total mass times the final velocity. So we can solve for the final velocity. It's the initial momentum divided by the sum of the masses, and we end up with 1.67 meters per second. So the kinetic energy initial is 11. The kinetic energy final is 8.33. So it's inelastic. Kinetic energy is not conserved during the collision. And for all collisions where the object sticks together, it's going to be inelastic. And if they're inelastic, we say that it's totally, I mean, if they stick together, we say it's totally inelastic. So if you hear the word totally inelastic, that means they stuck together. And if you hear they stuck together, it's totally inelastic. We also have elastic collisions, and we did this in lecture, and we came up with these two equations. So if you have two objects and they're restricted to either move forward or backwards, so you can think of them as being on some long track and they can either move forward on the track or backwards on the track, right? And then we have totally elastic collisions or perfectly elastic collisions, it should say, right? Perfectly elastic collisions. In this case, the kinetic energy is conserved. So now we've derived these equations and you can use them for any totally elastic collision. So for example, here we have M1, 
it's 10 kilograms. It's moving at 2 meters per second. Then we have 12 kilograms moving at negative 3 meters per second. So we can plug in the values. We get M1 is 10 kilograms minus 12 kilograms over the sum of the masses, 12 kilograms plus 10 kilograms. And V1 initial is 2 meters per second. And twice M2, so that's 2 times 12, over the sum of the masses, 12 kilograms plus 10 kilograms. And this time, it's negative 3. And don't forget, these negative and positive signs are important with the velocities. And we end up with negative 3.45. So M1 has turned around and headed in the other direction, going faster, right? So a large mass moving faster collides with a smaller mass moving slower, and M1 takes off in the other direction, going about 3.45 meters per second. Then we can plug in for V2. This will be 2 times M1, which is 10 kilograms, over 10 kilograms plus 12 kilograms times 2 meters per second, and then 12 kilograms minus 10 kilograms over the sum of the masses times negative 3, we end up with 1.54. So these two things collide, and then they head back in the opposite directions. So M2 starts moving this way at 1.54, slower, and M1 starts moving in the negative x direction faster. We talked about the center of mass in, in lecture, and the reason this is important is because during these collisions or explosions, right, the, um, its momentum is still, um, it follows the it'll follow a projectile motion, for instance, and its center of mass will follow the projectile motion. So the horizontal component of the projectile's motion is conserved if air resistance is negligible. Even in this case where the space probe separates. So the forces causing the separation are internal to the system so that the net external force is still zero. That's the net external horizontal force is still zero. The vertical component of the momentum is not conserved because the net vertical force in the y direction is not zero. In the vertical direction, the space probe Earth system needs to be considered and we find that the total momentum is conserved. The center of mass of the probe takes the same mass, the same path it would if the separation didn't occur. So we have the same thing if we look at a shell that explodes, right, and we follow its center of mass, it'll follow its initial trajectory even though these pieces are going off at, at a different path. So this conservation of momentum is great for looking at things. So for instance, this subatomic particle scatters straight bar backward from a target particle. In experimenting, se seeking evidence for quarks, electrons were observed to occasionally scatter straight backwards from a proton. An elastic one-dimensional two-object collision Momentum and internal, ener and internal kinetic energy are conserved. So as we said, if this is a frictionless surface and we have a collision, not only for, so for elastic, not only is momentum conserved, but kinetic energy is also conserved. In an inelastic collision, momentum is conserved, but internal kinetic energy is not conserved. So these are two objects of e equal mass initially head towards one another at the same speed. They st the objects stick together in a perfectly or a totally inelastic collision. So their final velocity is zero. 
and the internal energy of the system changes in any inelastic collision. And in this example, in fact, it's reduced to zero. Here we have a hockey puck coming in and hitting the hockey, and the hockey player is on their knees and, the, and um, catches it in their gloves. And before the net force is equal to zero, and P1 equals P total, and then after the collision, we have P prime, P1 prime, which is the momentum of the puck, plus P2 prime, which is the momentum of the hockey player. Okay, and what's going to happen? The hockey player will move back slightly with a small velocity. So an, uh, an ice hockey player catches a hockey puck and recoils backwards, and the initial kinetic energy of the puck is almost entirely converted into thermal energy and sound in this elastic collision. If we wanted to simulate an explosion well, or, or, an inelastic or an elastic collision, what we could have is a mass with a spring and it's on a frictionless surface like an air track and they'll come together and cause a collision. And an air track is nearly frictionless, so the momentum is conserved. And the motion is one-dimensional. In the collision, and this is explained in example 8.6, the potential energy of the compressed spring is released during the collision and is converted into internal kinetic energy. If we have a two-dimensional collision, so in this case, we have maybe an air hockey puck smacks into another air hockey puck and it moves off in this direction. In this case, the two-dimensional collision with the coordinate system chosen so that M2 is initially at rest and V1 is parallel to the x-axis. This coordinated system is sometimes called the laboratory coordinate system and because of the many scattering experiments have a target that is stationary in the lab. While the particles that scatter from it um, to determine the particles that make up the target and how they are bound together. And these particles may be observed directly, but their initial may not be observed directly, but their um, initial and final velocities are. So what we have is we look at um, the system before and M1 has some velocity and M2 is sitting there and then they go off in either direction. In this case, we have to conserve momentum in the X direction and momentum in the Y direction. Don't forget, momentum's a vector. We break it up into X and Y coordinates and the X components initially have to equal, the sum of the X components initially have to equal the sum of the X components final and the sum of the y components initial have to equal the sum of the y components final. So for instance, if I look at this uh, case, initially there's just momentum in the x direction. That means that my final y momentum for one has to equal my final um, y momentum for two, but they have to point in opposite directions because they have to cancel because initially the momentum in the y direction was zero. And if I look at the mass times the x velocity of m1 plus the mass times the x velocity of m2, that has to equal the mass times the initial velocity of m1. So momentum is going to be conserved in the x direction and in the y direction. So a complete collision taking place in a dark room is explored in example 8.7. And the incoming momentum M1 is scattered with a stationary object. And only the stationary objects M2 is, is known. And by measuring the angle and speed at which M1 emerges, it's possible to calculate the magnitude and direction of the initially stationary object's velocity 
after the collision. And we do this by using conservation of momentum. So we can also talk about how rockets work by looking at momentum. So this rocket has a mass m and an upward velocity of v. And it has a net external force on the system is minus mg if air resistance is negligible. And at some time delta t later, the system has two main parts, the ejected gas and the remainder of the rocket. So the reaction force in the rocket is what overcomes the gravitational force and then accelerates upward. So the space shuttle had a number of reusable parts. It had solid fuel boosters on either side that were recovered and refueled after each flight. And the entire orbiter returned to Earth for use in subsequent flights. And a large fuel tank was expended. And the space shuttle was a complex assemblage of technologies employing both solid and liquid fuel and pioneering ceramic tires, tiles as re-entry heat shields. And as a result, it permitted multiple launches as opposed to a single use rocket. By the way, we can find out a lot about materials such as crystals by firing objects into it. So in this case, we have a small object approaches a collision with a much more massive cube, and after which its velocity has the direction theta 1. And the angles at which the small object can be scattered are determined by the shape of the object it strikes and the impact parameter. So in lecture, we'll talk more about momentum.